All right, so um, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so my name is Daniel Ku. I'm the project lead for uh, EX Web Driver project, and um, I'm also one of the original creators of this project. Um, so today we want to basically walk through um, our tool, and hopefully by the end, you know, you guys find this interesting and and uh, helpful, and hopefully see more adoptions in your organization. All right, so here's the agenda. Um, quickly, we're going to go over uh, about FINRA, and then I'm going to walk through the history of the project, and then we're going to show a hello world example, then dive into the architecture of the software, and then we, uh, we're going to show more extended examples, and finally, um, showcase some of our upcoming open source projects. All right, so about FINRA. So FINRA stands for Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. We are the largest independent regulator for all of the uh, security firms doing business in the U.S. So high level, um, what we do is we enforce rules, we create rules, and then we uh, you know, make sure that the firms and securities representatives actually comply with these rules. Um, we also monitor the market data um, to detect you know, frauds and potential frauds. Uh, we also provide um, education, so all the people that are registered with us, they need to uh, take our exams um, to actually do this work, and we provide some continuing education as well. Um, just to provide some numbers, so we deal with more than 4,500 4, brokerage firms, uh, 163,000 branch offices, and more than 600,000 registered security um, representatives. and. On a, on a day, typically we monitor six billion um, trades. So, you know, the type of analysis that we do and and the you know, the workflows that goes into our applications, it's very complex in nature. So, um, we pay attention to our quality of our software because you know we we want to make sure our software behaves, and uh, that's why we put a lot of our energy into um, test automation. You know, we want to make our testing efforts. Uh, much better efficient and cost effective so you know a lot of our effort goes into this and this is one of the reasons why we created this project and and more and more we're spending our effort on creating open source projects so we can you know contribute contribute back to our uh, open source community all right so history on the project so the initial code base was created in 2007 um, so it was seven years ago and um, this is when one of our projects uh, started to adopt AJAX, so we uh, started to use uh, Yahoo UI EXT, and, and, and this was um, when we were using WinRunner as our tool for automation, and WinRunner didn't support um, AJAX testing, so we had to look for alternatives. Um, and, and we looked at the industry, and we saw a lot of adoption of Selenium RC, so it was getting really popular, and uh, what we want to do is, is try this out. And, and this was very appealing to us too because it was an open source tool, so it was cost effective. And we were looking for a tool that was allowing us to do cross-browser testing and, and Selenium was promoting that they do cross-browser testing. So, you know, this made perfect sense to us. And um, since Selenium provided different language bindings, um, we had to choose something. And we chose Java because we had Java developers available to help us out in exploring the tool as well as developing automation. Um, <coughs> so we, uh, we started to adopt this in one project and then what we started to do was we try to you know, expand across different projects as well. We saw a lot of value, we saw benefits in one project and then we started to now try you know, this tool in other projects. As we were doing that, we you know, figured that <coughs> A lot of projects were doing similar things. So they're, they're taking Selenium RC, the API, and a lot of people were pretty much reinventing the wheel at, at, at certain points. And um, this is when we start to think about, okay, how can we extend Selenium? How can we extend that so that we can create some reusable APIs you know, that can be leveraged across? Um, so we, we, we start to extend, and then we also <coughs> figure that, okay, we want to easily manage our sessions, the Selenium sessions that we create. So we, we created a layer that does a better management and also easy way for us to configure for our execution. So our extensions start to grow as we start to see more adoption across different projects. 
um, the model that we adopted was page object model. Um, this is the model that, uh, that is recommended by the Selenium community. Um, <coughs> but again, when we adopted this model where we're creating you know, UI classes that represent each of the pages of the application, we didn't feel that the, the, the reusability was maximized. Right? So <coughs> we started to think about other ways to truly maximize our reusability. Um, and while we were thinking about this, we were introduced to Selenium 2.0. This was when WebDriver <coughs> merged with the Selenium RC. Um, and this was late 2011. And when we, when we looked at the API, this was definitely um, a much cleaner API. And we really liked the web element concept. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the web element concept was not there for Selenium RC. Right, Selenium RC was more on the different actions that you can perform on the browser, but they didn't have a concept of elements. So when we looked at this, this was this was something that we could adopt and we could you know maximize our reusability. This is what we thought that you know we could take it into our, our framework, our tool, and start refactoring. So um, and, and 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 also the Selenium 2.0 was much better in terms of performance. Don't know um, if, if you guys remember or if you guys used Selenium RC back then. It was very very slow on IE. Like it was just drastically slow on IE, and <clears throat> a lot of our applications that we were supporting were running on IE. And um, you know our, our automation runs would take a long time. So when we saw Selenium 2.0 <clears throat> performing much better on IE, we were very happy. So we decided to basically take Selenium 2.0 and then rewrite our our. Um, our, our tool using this API. <coughs> so based on the web element concept is what came out, uh, um, we call it widget library, which we're going to walk through more in detail later. Um, and, and, and this is where we feel that you know, we can really have reusability. Um, so um, we define the interface hierarchy and we have implementation for some of these widgets as well so projects can start using them right away. <coughs> So we call our, our, our model the widget design pattern. So it's different than the page object model. We call it the, the, the widget design pattern, which we're going to walk through later on. So after we matured our tool, um, we started to uh, look at, you know, we got a lot from the open source community. So how can we contribute back? And also, you know, how can we get, you know, people to contribute um, into our tool, so we decided to um, release our, our software to the open source community. So this happened in late 2012, and um, it took us about a year to get it prepared, and then we finally launched in December 2013. So our uh, <coughs> software is hosted on GitHub. So this is what you see on the, the right side is um, the main homepage. This is where users can come. Learn about, learn about our tool, our, our API documentation is here, and also it, it, it talks about how you can uh, contribute to our software. What you see on the left side, <coughs> that's the GitHub project page. This is where our source code is, so you can check out, you can fork, and you can, uh, you can see what changes are being made to our source code. <coughs> our builds happen on Travis CI cloud-based uh, continuous integration server. So whenever we have uh, code changes or pull requests and merge requests, um, the build is kicked off right away on Travis CI, and then it runs our unit test to make sure everything is functioning correctly. Um, and we really like it. Travis CI has very good integration with GitHub, if you guys have used GitHub before. Um, and and um, you know, it offers uh, all the CI needs that we have for free. So this was our choice. And finally, we have our packages hosted on the Maven Central repo, so you guys can easily uh, um, create a dependency on our uh, software, and also you guys can download the jars and source code as well. All right. Any questions about project in general? These guys are going to go more deeper into what the tool is really about and show a more cooler example. Um, so. Now, I would like to introduce Dan Politano. He's going to give us a demo and walk through the architecture. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, 
Okay, I'm going to go through an overview of how to use EXT WebDriver to write a basic unit test. Brian, you said that the application was already running. Right. Just Chrome. That's a good Yeah. Just restart. <coughs> restart. Restart. Oh, restart. Uh, the application we're going to be testing is just a simple web page with a couple buttons uh, that change the test, uh, that change the text at the top. So transform transforms the text and revert reverts back. Now, if you look at the test, uh, you can see that it's pretty simple to get started. Uh, to get an instance of EXE WebDriver. Uh, all we're going to do is ask the session manager to get a new session. To navigate to uh, the application, we're going to call the open method on the ext webdriver uh, instance. And then to represent the elements on the web page uh, we want to interact with, uh, we can make use of the built-in widget library. Uh, we'll use a button class to represent the buttons, and we'll use an element class to represent the text button, or the, te the text. Uh, we instantiate the, them using some locator. In this case, we're going to use XPaaS. Uh, at this point, we're ready to start coding our asserts. Um, elements have a get text method we could use to get the text located in that element. Uh, so we're going to assert that the text is first um, equal to simple HTML buttons. And uh, the, the button widget has a, a click. Uh, method associated with it. So we're going to click the button to mimic a click on the transform button uh, and then assert the test that the text changed. Uh, we're going to click the revert button and then assert the text again. So if we run this test, Uh, we'll see that it passed. However, we don't see anything happening. Uh, this is because when we call get new session with no arguments, uh, we're asking for the default um, EXE WebDriver implementa implementation, which is um, HTML unit, a headless browser. Um, we could we could easily um, use another browser um, by passing in client properties. So if we if if in the second test uh, we're going to use Chrome. And uh, if we type in um, a client properties file, chrome.properties, um, it, it will check by, by setting the browser equal to Chrome, um, EXT WebDriver will um, load up a WebDriver set, uh, a Chrome driver um, session for you. Uh, if we run this test, <coughs> we'll see it running Chrome. It, it was very quick, but yeah, it's it did show up. It's just too it fast. Did click. So, if you run an IE, it's a little slower. So later on, we'll show an IE. <laughs> How many browsers does it support? It's uh, probably like ten. Like ten, but ultimately, you could you could set it up to support whatever you want. So. We, we support. We don't um, focus on like on mobile browsers, uh, but we do. We do offer like Android and iPhone. Uh, I know that we don't include Windows Windows Phone, for example, because we've never had a need for it. But you could you could uh, extend. You could write. I'll talk about later about how to write custom uh, session factories to um, to <coughs> instantiate like uh, what, whatever kind of what web driver instance you want. So what we. What we first did was to include the drivers that are part of Selenium, right? Um, that are shipped with Selenium. Right. But what he said, we can extend it to use different drivers, custom drivers as well. So um, it's, it's extendable. Can we have a parallel execution? Like, 
<coughs> you can have a little test running on different yeah, instances. I'm, I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk later about um, how it's easy to run multi-threaded. Mm -hmm. um, but long story short, yeah, it's very easy to run parallel tests with the tool. Okay. Um, now that we've seen an example, I'm going to give an overview of the architecture. Uh, the two main components are the session management and uh, the widget library. And I'm going to talk about the details over the next few slides. Uh, EXT WebDriver, or extensions for WebDriver, is just that, an extension of WebDriver. Um, EXT WebDriver is an extension of the WebDriver interface, so we include all the WebDriver functionality, and we also provide an easy API for performing common actions like opening a page and selecting a frame that you could do in WebDriver but may require more complicated syntax. Uh, we also extend WebDriver's API with things like scrolling the page and selecting the most recently selected frame that isn't included in the, in the native WebDriver API. Uh, since EXT WebDriver is an interface, the underlying implementation of EXT WebDriver is customizable, so you could choose to use the default EXT WebDriver, or you could build a custom implementation if you want to. Session and configuration. Uh, as we saw in the example, a session corresponds to, to an instance of EXT WebDriver. We, we create it by either asking for the default driver with default properties, HTML unit, or by providing a client property file to be used in generating the session. Uh, client properties can include things like uh, browser, highlighting mode, and timeout parameters. Brian's going to go over um, editing a few of these in the extended example later. Uh, calling the close method on EXT WebDriver uh, closes the browser window and stops the the driver running with it. I, I forgot to show this um, in, the, in the test, but uh, after, in, order, in order to close, so when you when you get a new session, um, EXT WebDriver is going to start up any any browser any um, web driver driver associated with it. So um, they'll set up IE driver server if you're running IE, for example. And then in order to um, close that, so you don't have any memory leaks, after each test, uh, we always have this uh, session .close call. Um, that'll that'll close that for you. Just to sorry to interject, but um, so for the client properties, um, there are a lot of different things that we put in there that makes it easier for you guys to um, create the sessions and, and and also apply the desired capabilities. You know how Selenium supports the desired capabilities, right? We made it so that you can basically put it in the properties file and apply the desired capabilities. So. Things like setting up Selenium Grid and Sauce Labs and, and such, those are, our, with, those, those are all contained within the client properties. Um, and, and if you guys go to our web, web site, our homepage, it lists out all the different properties that you guys can apply. Okay. Uh, session management. Uh, the session factory is what produces the actual instance of EXT WebDriver that you use in your tests. Uh, by default, the default session factory is used and uses the client properties if you specify them to construct the desired capabilities to be used. Uh, however, the default session factory has some limitations. Uh, for instance, like I said, there's no current support for the Windows Phone driver, for instance, because this only came out a month before we uh, released open source. And, and we've never had a need for it at FINRA, so we never thought, um, we never looked to support it. Um, uh, although it's supported by, by WebDriver. Uh, this is why we give the ability to set custom session factories um, that you could set up, so you could set up EXT WebDriver instances however you want. Um, you may, you may want to set up capabilities that, that um, <coughs> the default session factory doesn't look for in client properties, uh, or you may want to maybe programmatically set some values. Some people here uh, have used custom session factories to set to programmatically set the name capability uh, to be the name of the test running uh, instead of the default, which has information like the session ID associated with the test. Um, so, you, so when we run tests in Sauce Labs, uh, what's displayed next to the test is, is the name capability. 
um, at the name capability value. Uh, so in the in the Sauce Labs dashboard, you'll see the name of the J unit test next next to it uh, instead of the session ID. Um, you asked about multi-threading. Uh, session manager provides a simple way to manage your your set. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, Sorry, the session manager allows for simple multi-threading out of the box. Uh, the session manager also helps you out so that you don't have to worry about um, constructing your session factories at all. All you're going to interact with is, is the session manager. Uh, the session manager is attached to a thread local, um, so you don't need to worry about synchronizing the threads. Um, an, inst an instance of session manager is automatically associated with each thread. Just to expand on that a little bit, um, what we use for running the tests in parallel is, is we use JUnits. So JUnit already supports running things in parallel. Right? So we, we run it in parallel mode, but we made our code to handle different threads. Right? So we made it thread safe so you can actually leverage that. Because if we didn't, and if we just run JUnit in parallel, things, will, things won't work. But that's what we focus on to make our code thread safe so you can leverage the uh, threat or multi uh, multi thread execution. Okay. Uh, the second main component of EXT WebDriver, like Daniel said, is the is the widget library. As Daniel mentioned earlier, originally we had a page object model for representing the application's functionality. However, this didn't scale well and didn't really prom promote code reuse. Uh, so this is when we decided to adopt an object model design. But by using and extending the included widget library, uh, we see increased reusability since the code works at a component level uh, and not at the page level. So we could, re we could reuse components on different pages. EXT WebDriver comes packaged with a hierarchy of widget interfaces that could be implemented and extended. Uh, we, and we also ship EXT WebDriver today with the default HTML widget library that has popular controls like checkboxes, uh, drop-down menus, and buttons. Uh, we're working on creating uh, a GWT and jQuery UI widget libraries also. Um, however, you, you guys are welcome to help us out through contributions on GitHub. There are GitHub tickets already created for us to work on, so if you guys want to sign up and, and work on up. that, that would be awesome. <laughs> Uh, at this point, I'll describe for you the widget hierarchy, which is the hierarchy of interfaces that constitute the model for our widget implementations. At the top is iElement, which includes the bulk of the hierarchy's functionality, including uh, methods like isElementPresent, isElementVisible, and, and ScrollToElement. Uh, from iElement from is uh, iReadableElement. Uh, which adds the functionality to have a value or label pulled from it. Uh, then we get into the I interactive elements, uh, which allow you to perform interactive actions like clicking, right clicking, mouse over, and other actions. Um, I hyperlink, I button, I image, <coughs> I label, uh, all, all extend interactive element and provide additional functionality uh, like being able to get an href attribute for the hyperlink or a source attribute for an image. Uh, the next class of, of widgets are the i-editable elements, which allow an input to be given to them. Uh, things like uh, text field, checkbox, calendar, dropdown, radio group, and select list uh, extend this interface, which allow values to be set in whatever manner is appropriate for the widget. So the uh, another reason for setting interfaces um, was <clears throat> because we have a lot of projects and we have a lot of applications that we're developing and we wanted our, our automation developers to follow the same you know type of design patterns as well as uh, same set of interfaces when they create their widgets because the fact that a lot of people were creating their own things in their own ways we want us to standardize how we create our automation code and, and this really helped us to get there because everybody was speaking the same language, right? They were, okay, I know when I start developing automation I need to first create widget library and I got to look at this uh, interfaces and start developing to that. And also look at, hey, what other um, 
implementation that we already have, and I can start from there. If not, then start creating our own using the hierarchy. Uh, also in this model, you guys could see that there's a class element that comes from my element. Uh, EXT WebDriver comes packaged with a an ele a default element um, uh, implementation. So next, I'm going to go over uh, the element class, uh, which is the base class for for any widget. Uh, we instantiate an element by giving it a locator. Uh, it, you could give it an XPath CSS selector. ID, name, um, anything that WebDriver supports. Um, however, the element class, when you, when you search for the element, will just infer which uh, type that you're thinking of. So you, you don't have to <coughs> worry about any um, by syntax. Um, elements wrap a web element object and allow you and allow you to get. Uh, and, and uh, allow you to get the web element so that you could perform web driver actions on the, on the web element if you'd like. Uh, however, you'll probably find you don't need to do this since the element comes with an extensive array of convenient methods like wait for element present, wait for element visible, uh, wait for attribute present. Uh, and when set in client properties, uh, XC WebDriver allows for e easy debugging by highlighting the, the element in different colors when you search for the element, get text for it, or, or click on it. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Brian Robbins, who's going to go over a more in-depth uh, extended example of what you could do with extended WebDriver. Uh, I have a question. Um, earlier in your talk, you said that the, um, the default browser you use is HTML units. And I was just wondering if you uh, actually, you know, do you use HTML unit, and if so, um, have you also uh, had any experience using um, Ghostdriver with Phantom JS? I've used uh, Phantom JS before. I personally, I don't, I don't run tests on it. Uh, what we find it good for is for like unit tests. Since it's since it's headless, it's the fastest browser you could use. Um, personally, I, the applications I support um, aren't supported on a headless browser, so I, I use Chrome, Firefox, IE. Um, but sorry, uh, maybe our unit else. tests our unit tests for EXT WebDriver actually use the Phantom driver, right? So the things <coughs> we run on Travis every time we do a build, they're all done with the headless browsers. Uh, we're working to extend that because we'd actually like to test every widget that we produce under all the supported browsers, right? And there's tools like uh, Sauce Labs offers open source, right? So we could use open source to go out and try this on 300 different configurations or something. Um, so that's in, the, that's in the plans to get more coverage on the different drivers and know where we have problems and then fix them, right? And, and also, we actually do use, Phantom, we actually did use Phantom Driver, um, and we do use Phantom Driver. Um, for client-side code testing, which I think Brian's going to walk through later. So um, we're using Karma. I don't know whether you guys have heard of Karma. Um, Karma is, is actually used for JavaScript testing, and we are doing more of this isolated client-side code testing. And when we do this, we want to really run faster. And for, for faster execution, we thought headless browser is much faster to execute. And for this, since we're testing JavaScript code, Right? It, it really doesn't matter for us. We just need a JavaScript engine to run the JavaScript code, right? So using headless browser actually um, was sufficient for us to test our JavaScript code. So yes, we do use Phantom Driver. Um, but HTML unit driver is what's shipped with Selenium. So that's why we use that as a default. But we did use Ghost Driver as well. Okay, I have another question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, when you're running the test and you click on a button or you're waiting for an attribute in some web element or something like that, those um, items are, did I understand correctly, that they're highlighted? So if you, Brian will show how you could uh, set the client properties so that you could um, enable highlighting, but um, he, he's going to show you guys yeah, we have an <laughs> how to enable highlighting for you. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'll just pick up where Dan's examples left off. So the, the last example that Dan showed was um, running, uh, running a pretty simple test against Chrome. Right? So we said that all we had to do to specify a browser 
was to use a client properties and specify browser equals Chrome. Uh, this is supported by the default session factory. Um, there are some other problems with this test that are pretty like jumping out at you if you've done automation for much time at all, right? So we, for one thing, we've got like locators uh, right inside the test. So this means that when my developer does a new drop or a new half drop or whatever they're doing, I have to come in and modify my code in order to uh, uh, update the locators uh, fairly often, right? So uh, one, one feature that we ship with uh, EXT WebDriver is uh, a properties sort of manager for this kind of thing, right? So my XPath in this case was this button one, which is a pretty, <laughs> pretty bad XPath, right? Because if they add another button to the page, uh, this may be button two or something like that, right? So um, we have some features for things like, um, so we, we have features for this uh, GUI properties and basically this, um, you know, as long as it's, it's, it's on the uh, class path of your test, right? So let's go ahead and pull up the example. Right, so we can put our locators in here. So that's one, uh, one nice step in the, in the right direction, right? Another feature that's supported by this uh, GUI properties um, uh, abstraction, I guess, is uh, parameterizing that. So, for example, if, if these are buttons one and two, or if I wanted to key them on a certain ID, um, I could write in my test, you know, um, let's see, when I want to fetch this GUI property, whoops, when I want to fetch a property, I fetch it by its value, but I can also pass in optionally uh, parameters for that value. So you can kind of templatize uh, the locators in different ways, right? So we have support built in for uh, like level n, as many, as many parameters as you want to add for that kind of thing. So uh, that's been a useful feature for us, um, is to, to combine this sort of GUI properties approach in with the widget approach. So that when you instantiate the widgets, now you know uh, where you're going, and you can modify that without having to uh, technically recompile code, I guess, right? That's a nice, uh, nice to have. So we also wanted to show a more complex widget. So we have this whole widget hierarchy and some other uh, things. And what, what we also find useful is a lot of these more advanced frameworks for UI, they're using at their lowest level HTML uh, basic um, elements, right? And they're just combining those in interesting ways and using JavaScript to interact with these things, right? So here's an example of a jQuery app. Right, so uh, I've got two jQuery components here. We'll focus on this autocomplete widget, which ships with the jQuery UI uh, library. Right, and the, the basic functionality here is as you're typing, it will offer suggestions to you, right, and uh, as you click on a suggestion, it, it completes the thing. Right, so if I had to automate this, right, it looks a lot like an input box for one thing, right, but there's also the additional feature of, of the type ahead, the suggestions. Right? So let's check out the DOM and see what's going on. Okay, so I see that this is indeed implemented. Um, I don't know how readable that is. Okay, so this is actually implemented as an input box, right? So um, this is coming in as an HTML input element, and as my list pops up, that's being entered as a UL, unordered list, HTML element with its suggestions, right? So as it turns out, our widget hierarchy, or our, even our HTML widget library, has components pre-built for input and HTML list, both, right? So if we could combine these in whatever ways are needed by the app, right, then we can make a widget abstraction for this jQuery autocomplete. And that's sort of our vision, is that if we could do this for some of the more popular frameworks, then we could reuse those across who knows how many projects, you know, in our org or elsewhere, Right, so uh, GWT and jQuery are the ones that are kind of in our on our radar. But if there were others that were heavily used, right, this would be a, a decent idea. Right, so what we're going to try to do is uh, write this thing, write a widget to support this. Okay, so this is going to be my autocomplete widget uh, since it's most. Uh, I guess its most salient presence in the DOM, I would say, is this input uh, element. I'm going to go ahead and extend our basic HTML input element so that we get all the functionality of that baked in. Okay. 
Okay, and we need a uh, constructor that matches that. My trusty IDE came through on that one. Okay, so uh, basically this is passing whatever locator we provide for the autocomplete widget is going to be used as the locator for its input box. So not the locator for its list or some other component of it in the DOM, right? So that should be fine for us. We just have to remember when we're working with the suggestion list that it needs its own locator that's different from that, right? Um, so the next thing um, in terms of a design for this, right? So if we were doing this as a... Um, HTML list. So let's take a look at what the kinds of functions that supports. Okay, so here's the code for our HTML list. Um, so you can see it extends element and implements the I element interface. Actually, that's given, given that it extends element, right? And the kinds of things it's supporting for us and for our tester is uh, get item count, get item, get items, and then a JavaScript eval at, on that uh, element. So if we wanted to support all those, one strategy might be to write a get item for our autocomplete that has some sort of parent or uh, uses aggregation basically to go into the unordered <laughs> list and get an item. But um, the design pattern we tend to use and that we found that's more maintainable is to expose this sort of child element um, via this class. So basically create a getter for the suggest box and then you have an HTML list widget that you can use um, all of its given features directly. So something like this. Okay, now this needs to create um, some new HTML list component. Okay, now we need a locator for this HTML list. So we have to figure out in terms of the implementation of this jQuery widget, is there anything consistent that they're doing that we could use as a locator? Um, So this would take some playing around to make this as robust as possible, right? But if we just look in the DOM to see what's happening, we see this class UI-autocomplete being added to the unordered list element. So we can look for that class in terms of a, a locator for this, right? So let's um, do that. And what also one thing we could do is continue to leverage the GUI properties for this so that if we do need to tweak this or we realize that our X path wasn't generic enough or needs a parameter or something like that, uh, for example, to get the second unordered list on a page, uh, maybe we'd have to tweak this later. So let's do that via a um, properties file. So I've created a properties file here with a property called suggest list that has an X path based on the class name. Right. So again, this is just the uh, one, one way to do this. We also support directly using class names and locators. So you could just give UI-autocomplete as the... Um, as the locator itself. So we'll need to leverage that um, GUI properties object. And this is a class path uh, reference, right? That's the name of my property. Okay, and we'll be a little lazy and just throw the exception. Uh, we, we might be a little cooler if this were production stuff. Okay, so now we've got the list, um, and we need to return this back, but there's a couple of other things we might want to do in terms of ease of use for a calling <laughs> tester. Right, so before you can actually use this list, there's a couple of checks that you would normally do. And so we like to bake those checks into the widget class rather than force the tester to have to run these directly. So this would be things like making sure the element is present in the DOM and visible in the browser. 
right? So uh, we can go ahead and add those two checks directly. Uh, because this is our uh, input uh, element that we're working with, we can go ahead and check that directly. So we'll wait for it to be present. And wait for it to be visible. And finally return. Okay, so this is our basic strategy for um, widget classes in general. Um, sometimes you want to do more uh, elaborate things. For example, um, given that this is a suggest box, maybe we want to support the ability to type something in and then click one of its results. Right? So we don't want in every test to have to come in here and make several API calls to the widget maybe. Right? So we could bake some of those sort of combined uh, things together here too. But for now, let's, uh, let's go with this. I'm going to save myself a little trouble and just build this into here. Actually, let's just go here. Okay, so we'll go straight to the code for this so we don't have to watch me uh, type any more code. So um, in terms of a JUnit test, I mean this looks pretty similar to what we did before. Let's just uh, get a session, right? So I put my session inside of a setup method. Uh, if I want to use Chrome every time, right, this is how I, I would do that. Um, so I, I want to open the session to this uh, particular uh, index. And then I want to validate that one of the labels is present. So that, that's the accordion label from the page. And finally use my autocomplete widget, at least my trusty backup <laughs> gold version of it, right, to uh, interact with this thing. And I'm going to give it a locator of autocomplete. Uh, because in my HTML, I've used an ID of autocomplete, and our locator functionality supports IDs directly. So then we want to type the letter F toward this. So type is supported because we extended the input widget. And then we want to assert that two items are available. So the item count of the suggest box at that point is two. So given the app, you know, let's do this manually. The letter F offers two suggestions. Okay. <coughs> Running this in Chrome? Yeah. Okay. So it'll be quick, right? Pretty quick. Get ready. Done. Cool. Okay. So uh, that's the basic idea of a, of a widget class. Uh, I mentioned that, that we might want to do cooler things, and so I'll just show one cooler thing here. Uh, one thing we might want to do is like a type then select functionality. Right? So we wrote a method called type and select. Uh, you would give it the string that you wish to type and the item which you wish to eventually select. Um, and basically um, get the suggest list, so after you've typed what you wanted to type, Loop over the, the suggest list looking for the element you wish to select. And until that's found, or when that is found, click on it. If we get this far and we've never found it, uh, we have sort of an exception uh, built in. It's sort of a locator sensitive exception. So that you'll get a message saying, I tried this locator, but I could not find uh, whatever. So it's a, it'll combine your message with the locator um, just for a little bit cleaner exception handling. Right? So we have a test that uh, uses that. Right, so it would look something like this. We instantiate the widget the same way, but then we type F and select cold fusion. And once we've selected cold fusion, we can assert that the value in the input box is actually cold fusion. Okay, and one other thing to mention in terms of a detailed example was the highlight functionality. So um, as we're sort of debugging tests, uh, it's sometimes useful to have a little more info about where the test was when something hung up or when something crashed, right? So we, we have this highlighting feature built into our default session factory. Um, it's basically going to be the same test that I was doing with GUI properties before. 
So the same test with the GUI properties. But this time our GUI properties are um, an IE highlight dot property. So let's check that file out. Okay, so this says that it's IE. And with IE, we need to also specify a version of IE to use, assuming you have multiple versions on the machine. And enable the debug mode. So th this syntax is just debug mode equals true. Uh, by default, it's off because it does slow down the test uh, a bit to do this highlighting functionality. So let's run this just to give an idea. So Dan mentioned that the kinds of things it's doing, when it finds an element, it's using one color. When it interacts with an element, using a different one. When it verifies something about an element, it uses a third color. Uh, and this is extensible. It's, uh, we have an interface called, like, is highlightable or something like that that's built into our EXT web driver uh, interface. And so you could turn this on or off or add more colors. If you're into deeper debugging, you could add all, all those kind of features to it. Um, so uh, that concludes this sort of extend an example in, in terms of EXT web driver. Now we also wanted to show, so you may have noticed that all of my web apps are coming through on the local host and uh, that's, nothing, that's nothing too crazy. But the reason we're doing that, so we, we've noticed that, um, you know, Daniel mentioned we're, we're getting a little bit more into uh, client side testing. Right? So instead of, of thinking of automation in terms of an end-to-end, -end, set up the data, uh, run the test, tear the data down, right? we're thinking in terms of mocking the service layer. Right? So if we can mock the REST calls that are happening behind an app, then we can test much faster and much more reliably at the UI layer. And I can exhaustively test the UI, which is where my nastiest, most user-facing bugs come from, right? I mean, depending on your, your apps. Right? So we've seen some value in this, especially on, on projects that are adopting things like um, jQuery or, or um, AngularJS is another popular one, right? where you're, you're required to sort of have this clean MVC, all the UI logics in one place, the service layers in one place. Right? With GWT, it's a little more difficult. That's sort of the other camp of our applications. But if you've got this clean separation, you can mock the service layer and then worry about testing just the UI layer. So I have an example test just to show you uh, our strategy with that. And this is a forthcoming um, open source release for us. So we're, I'm trying to finish it by Q2 of this year, maybe early Q3, and get it out. Um, it's a pretty simple piece of code, actually. So basically, we're using Node.js um, to run server, like a JavaScript type of server. And if you have your application available there, I, it, will, it will run it for you. So I have like a web app folder with my web apps directly here, and it's serving up these web apps to me. <coughs> now, in terms of a test, as part of my JUnit test, I can set up the type of service layer that I expect uh, to receive. All right, so here's a simple one, um, autocomplete with mock. And this is basically setting up the mock, mock response to give me back a list of two things, ABC and AAA. So it doesn't matter what I've, what I've done on the UI level, all I'm, all I'm telling my JavaScript is to call this mock service, and the mock service, when it sees that particular REST call, is going to respond this particular way. Right? So I don't have to worry about the, function, the full functionality of the service layer. Right? So that's sort of the idea there. And uh, to give a different example, uh, you know, this one is doing a more complicated response, just with more options if you type the word <laughs> script. Uh, you should expect to see these three or four things. And this is my uh, window uh, where my Node.js is running. So we can see when the mocks uh, pop up, although Chrome's going to, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the mock was registered and then it responded with that mock and so forth. So uh, this is sort of a, a newer thing for us, this JavaScript testing, but given that we can test much faster that way and still find uh, most of our major bugs, uh, and then we can also exhaustively test just the service layer as a separate task, um, it, it's, it's proven uh, useful. Right, so <clears throat> our interest of test is these files. Those are all of our client-side code, right? HTMLs, your CSS, and 
your JavaScript. So we load that up, and we have our local web server running. And then the web server is listening to um, API call saying, hey, register this you know, uh, service. And when you see this, respond with this instead. So imagine you know, when we were doing EXT Web Driver, it was actually making a server-side call, going to the database, figuring out what the languages are, and then returning back. So that's an additional time. And you know, that's a system-level testing, which we need to do, of course. Right? We need to do that. But what we're trying to do is minimize that you know, type of testing because that's where we spend a lot of our time developing and maintaining, but do a more isolated testing. So we test client side, we, we test the heck out of the client side, and then we test the heck out of the rest and, and the, the server side, and then we do a minimalistic you know, system level testing. And this proved to be very beneficial and valuable in terms of cycle time, how long it takes to actually you know, do the development and execution. Okay, so I'll show this for a quick second. Uh, so we've already mentioned the, the mock web server and some of the JavaScript tools around that. So that's sort of our next target for, for open source. And you saw how it interacts with what we're already doing with DXT WebDriver. Another major uh, thing which we've had in use since the beginning, so like six or seven year history of this, is something called a JTAF Core. So this is our sort of end-to-end -end automation framework. Uh, instead of writing JUnit tests, if we have staff that are uh, more comfortable writing like an XML, describe my tests in XML, and then map those to Java classes. Right? So this has been done many times, but for us we have a particular implementation of it that we like. So I can show a quick example of that. Uh, and this is coming like Q4 of this year is our target. So basically we define first all of our Java classes. So we have something like an open application uh, command and then that's to a, a Java class called Open Application, right? And then we do the same for several different uh, command classes, we call them. Let me show an example of a command class. Right? So a command class is basically just um, has a method called execute. And inside of Execute, we can use EXT WebDriver or any other Java APIs to do what we, what we want to do, right? So this basically abstracts out all the coding knowledge and lets you focus on the test scenario development, if that's... So in our organization, that was a pretty useful thing as some of our staff were comfortable with Java code and could go into detail on doing specific things. But then we could reuse those components in thousands of tests, right? So um, in terms of a script, this is how these things tie together. So once we've created commands, we can chain them together in this XML type of uh, um, markup, right? Uh, call our open application command, select language. Uh, these are doing the same things that we were doing in JUnit, but with an XML layer on top. And uh, this is also a lot more readable from that business analyst requirements uh, perspective. So we can map this directly to a pretty nice traceability matrix. Uh, and you can see exactly what steps were done. We map it to tools like Quality Center, Right, HP tools that uh, you want to have a traceability, you want to know this was executed, here's the exact step that failed. So this is all there where we wouldn't have that in JUnit alone. Right? So uh, yeah, this is, this is what's on our radar uh, coming up. So uh, time for questions then? Do you want to show the last page? Stuff? Oh yeah, let's land there. Yeah. So these are our links to our uh, home page and, uh, and our um, Google group. So. I encourage everybody to you know, come and check it out. Um, and you know, first, just give it a try. Give it a try and see how, how you guys like it. And, and you know, if you guys feel like this is something valuable and helpful, please use it in your organization. And we want to see more contribution from you know, the, the community. So please you know, look at what's available and what things that we're trying to do. And maybe you guys can help out. That would be really nice. So questions, open for any questions. Like there are certain things or features that you could have contributed back to WebDriver. Like, what was the reason behind <coughs> like creating a completely new thing and not updating WebDriver? So we reached out. Actually, um, we reached out to um, some of the guys, and I think on their mind they were pushing, not pushing, but they were more keen on the page object model, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's where the push was, and they're saying, mm, you know, I, I think 
you guys took it to another layer, but perhaps that's, you know, maybe you guys can kind of just do it, you know, within your domain, right? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a, we had some conversation. Because oh. we thought this is something exactly yeah, like you yeah, said, right? Yeah. That's the first thing we did actually was to reach out to them and say, "To me, that would make sense." Right? Why don't Why don't you know? Why don't we put this together and we can start to see more widget libraries, right, for different technologies, right. um, and and especially like GWT, where Google owns. You know, we're hoping that they'll you know think of this as as, as valuable, where they can as they're developing and releasing new versions of GWT, update your widget library so everybody that's using your tool to develop can also yeah. automate easily. Mm -hmm. It didn't fly with that. <laughs> so off the shelf, uh, can I have the same framework executable on HTML5? HTML5 type of, yeah, yeah. This, this should work on HTML5 type of and, web pages. Uh, can I have the <coughs> Wistia support? Wistia controls that Google provides where you upload your videos and run it and uh, See how it works. So does it have that uh, capability to support Wistia controls? Oh, yeah, I'm not familiar with the controls, but basically, if WebDriver can do it, we could build a layer that would abstract how you would do it with WebDriver. I mean, that would be our basic approach: is if if there's a control that is being done at the HTML layer or some other layer, and we can do it the, the way WebDriver would do it, we would just put a layer on top of that. Right. We will look at the WebDriver API and see if there's anything more convenient that we can make so users can easily do it. But if WebDriver supports it, we should also support it too. But what you mentioned, we haven't we haven't looked at it, so we haven't so no, not sure. <coughs> not sure, yeah. I think you have a question on, on the Yeah, I saw a couple come up. I'm not sure if you could <coughs> Yeah, this one. Okay, so this one says, it, it's a little small here, so I'll read it back to the room. Uh, quick follow-up on the question about supported platforms. Would EXT WebDriver be able to wrap Appium, Cylindroid, iOS driver, or other mobile WebDriver implementations? And, I, and the answer to that would be yes. Uh, you may have to do a custom session factory um, in order to accomplish this. So our, our default session factory supports a known set of drivers because it has a flat file to configure those drivers but extending that to support a new driver is not too complicated. It involves implementing an interface or actually extending the default and then overriding the capabilities related method. That's just a single method, right? Um, right. So as long as the desired capabilities of Selenium will support this and you can get it on your class path, uh, all should be well in terms of extending it. Another uh, issue that we have in terms of open source is that a lot of these drivers are not Apache V2, right? They're proprietary or, or other reasons, so we can't ship with support for them. They have to be baked in after the fact um, due to li uh, GPL license or anything like that that would not let us release under Apache V2, right? So that's just a technicality, unfortunately, but um, it's the way of life, I guess. Cool. Does that does that help answer the question? That was coming from Miris, I think. Uh, and then there's another one. Um, will EXT WebDriver work in a distributed testing setup? Can I leverage Selenium Grid? So Dan has done a lot of this. So you want to talk about the sauce or a grid? Yeah. Uh, I've actually never used a Selenium Grid on its own, but a lot of I've I've done some browser compatibility testing with Sauce Labs, and all you do there is in your client properties, uh, you set you set a property called use grid equal to true, and then uh, and then another property, I think it's grid.properties. Uh, in there, you specify your Sauce Labs uh, access key and, uh, and user ID. And then, um, yeah, they're all documented on, on our GitHub IO site. Um, but it's, it's, it's really easy to set up a grid or, uh, or Sauce Labs. Has, has anyone, Daniel, has anyone used um, Selenium grid without without sauce sauce labs. We uh, we we did a POC yes. So we tried it and it, it does work. Um, but for us, we chose sauce labs as our, our distributed and execution platform. So we don't use it in house, but it, it does work. 
I mean, Sauce is using a grid, so yes. the functionality is right. there. Right. Yeah, grid uh, URL is very quick. So here's all the, the pro properties, and this is a good sort of reference. So this is our GitHub I.O. page, which is sort of a user landing page. Um, we have all the, all the details about our GUI properties, compliant properties, and the different options there. So we see a lot about uh, Sauce Lab. Do we have something for browser stack? So we did a study, well, not a study, but we did a comparison with um, different, you know, um, cloud-based uh, platforms, and we looked at both Browser Stack and Sauce Labs. Um, at that time, I think this was like a year ago, um, Sauce Labs was, was had more features and it actually met our requirements, so we chose Sauce Labs. But <laughs> lately, I've seen uh, good things about Browser Stack. We don't have that support here, but um, I'm sure you know it's easy for us to extend it to also um, make it work for browser stack. We just haven't um, integrated yet. If they're, if they're using a grid, it should actually be you could directly use it. But I'm not sure. Yeah, about I'm sure. Way. I'm sure they also use a remote web driver too. So I think it's possible with browser. It's, it's possible with browser stack. We just don't have anything. Any experiments in past? Any ex <laughs> with browser stack? Well, we did we did a run in browser stack just to test the performance between Sauce Labs, and Sauce Labs was more performing at that time. I think now they're claiming they're better than Sauce Labs. Yeah, of course. Don't know, are. don't know, but um, you know, um, but we did, we did try it out, yeah. Yes? Um, for the uh, uh, client-side JavaScript testing, uh, you had a, a local instance of um, Node.js, uh, running. Um, how do you, um, uh, are you running those types of tests with um, Travis and, and how do you um, have that set up? Okay, so we, for the Travis builds, we don't use Node.js, um, we use Jetty Server. Okay. So we use Maven and we use Jetty Server for embedded, you know, server. So for that we don't use Node.js because Node needs to be installed on Travis, right? Because um, we have to have they, they may have Node installed, I don't know. For our, for our purpose, we didn't need um, Node because we're using Jetty Server. But we'll have to see if, if on Travis, if there's anything that we can pre-install what's needed for us to run it. I'm sure they probably have support for Node. Uh, Jetty Server, can you, what, what is that exactly? Doing the show? Sure. It's like a show. <coughs> code. <coughs> Open source code. Okay. <laughs> Uh, basically, it's an embedded. It's like an embedded server. It's like an, a lightweight alternative to something like Tomcat. Uh, and there are Maven libraries. You can say start Jetty before you run these tests. And so that was pretty easy off the shelf for us, just to say go get these dependencies and run Jetty. Um, yeah, there's there's Maven plugins. Yeah, very easy plugins for us to just say. Here is you know deploy it to this port or you know localhost this port. And then here is what you want to deploy it to. So it's just configuration. And then as you run your Maven, you know, goal, your verify, um, it'll start Jetty first, run your test, tear it down. Yeah, and yeah. you can probably see it. So here's what we do in our uh, in our own Palm file as far as using Jetty, right? Hope I can find it on the fly here. There, so there we go. Right. So we have it built into our step that's running integration test, right? Uh, with the, running those Phantom JS tests that, that we mentioned, and then we, uh, <coughs> we start and stop Jetty before and after. So we're not doing any of the mocking in terms of uh, our unit tests or anything like that. For for the JavaScript testing, um, Sauce Labs has a good um, platform for us to do JavaScript testing. They have all the Node.js integrations, Karma integrations. So we're using Sauce Labs actually for executing all of our JavaScript tests. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm just I'm curious. Um, there's there's almost 30 people here. Um, of the 30 people here, how many people here have the skill set to use that environment? Could you by show of hands? So the second part of the question is, what is everybody doing to learn? <coughs> Anybody? As soon as I go home, you have that I own. 
<laughs> well, I think it, it, it looked like about forty percent didn't have the skill set. About ten percent slowly raised their hands. <laughs> That's and a yeah. I mean, uh, could I ask why you're asking the question? Just curious. Uh, because the, the selenium is is growing quite quickly. Mm -hmm. as the you know cross browser method of you know testing right and i'm seeing a huge movement of the whole labor force trying to get into it yep and typically a lot